Bloodstream Journeys is produced by Bloodstream Media and made possible exclusively by Biomarin. Hi there, I'm Heather Robb and this is Journeys, a monthly podcast from Bloodstream Media that features the stories of three individuals within the bleeding disorders community. Now more than ever, it's essential that we find unique ways to connect with each other, and I sincerely hope this podcast can help you feel less isolated during these unprecedented times. And speaking of these unprecedented times, I don't know about you, but I have definitely had the uncanny feeling over the last three months that the entire world is at a standstill. We can't make plans, we can't see loved ones, in a lot of ways it feels like we're frozen in place, and that feels kind of crappy. But today's episode is a great reminder of how we can all move forward while standing still. Not without risk, not without uncertainty, but isn't that always how life is? This month's contributors are finding ways forward through this dark time, moving towards the light while sheltering in place. Our first contributor is Trevor Martin. Trevor is a very talented singer-songwriter living in Nashville, Tennessee. He graduated recently and was just stepping into his career when the global pandemic struck but he's not letting it hold him back. He recently released a new single, which you'll be hearing throughout the episode. And like so many artists, he's finding ways to continue putting his work out into a world that needs music more than ever. Here's Trevor Martin. I was eight years old and the local orchestra needed someone to sing I Want You Back by the Jackson Five for a show called Motown Madness. The orchestra was made up of the best musicians and singers in Bowling Green at the time. My parents took me to audition, and I'd always been a natural entertainer, singing a bunch and impersonating and doing all that kind of stuff. Much to our surprise, I got the job. I'll never forget the first night of that performance. When I got up and started singing, I just kind of lost control and started dancing like crazy and singing the song. Everybody thought it was awesome. At the end of the song, I tried to hop up on my toes like Michael did when he performed. And there were over a thousand people there to watch. And at the end of the song, I got a standing ovation. I ended up getting a standing ovation every night that we did the show. And that's really when I realized performing is pretty cool. And not only do I like it, but obviously these thousands of people like it too. Little did I know, that would be the beginning of this journey. I was born and raised in Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is just an hour from Nashville. At two days old, I wouldn't stop bleeding, and the doctor here in Bowling Green didn't really know what to do. So I was rushed to Vanderbilt University in Nashville in an ambulance, and of course, my parents were going crazy because they thought I was going to die. When we got to Vanderbilt, they said, hey, nothing to worry about. He's going to be fine. He has severe hemophilia A. My parents had no idea what that meant. Now, my mom's a science teacher, so she sort of understood, but they had a lot to learn. We had no family history whatsoever of hemophilia, but my parents did a great job. They got very involved with the local community and heard a lot of firsthand stories from THBDF, the Tennessee Hemophilia and Bleeding Disorders Foundation. That's our local chapter. We decided to plug in there, and a lot of people helped us out and assured us that it was going to be okay, whether that was just showing up and saying, hey, here I am, I'm a healthy person, or whether that was someone who sat down with us and really chatted with us for a long while about what it meant to be living with hemophilia. I was really, really helpful for my family. Despite having hemophilia, I was a very active kid. I played basketball and baseball and was on the swim team. But performing was always my favorite activity, especially after that breakthrough moment of singing with the orchestra at eight years old. I took some piano lessons, but it never really clicked. And then when I got to middle school, my voice started to change. I started really liking girls a lot and They knew I could sing a little bit. I was like, well, the piano is cool, but I think guitar would be cooler. One of my biggest musical influences was John Mayer, and I loved listening to his music, specifically the Continuum and Room for Squares albums. I listened to those albums a lot and learned how to play and sing a lot of his songs. It really helped me get better at guitar, an instrument that I'd mostly taught myself to play. And it was nice to learn from him since he's one of the best guitar players in the world. I started writing music about this time too, and he's an amazing songwriter, so it was really cool to look up to him in a lot of ways. So by my senior year of high school, I figured out that music was what I really wanted to do with my life. I started making money 
playing gigs and I was like, oh, <laughs> that was fun and really, really easy. People were starting to really enjoy my music too, which was so cool. I ended up getting a steady gig at a popular seafood restaurant in Bowling Green, playing for three hours just about every single night. A lot of people would come up to me after dinner and say, hey, we really like your music. Would you want to come play at our party? Or, hey, I'm getting married in a few months. Would you want to come play the music at our wedding? And I just thought that was really cool. Playing at the seafood restaurant really gave me some notoriety in town and just kind of let people know who I am and what I was doing. And it was really there that I learned I can actually do what I love and make some money. And it just kind of went from there. Now I'm living in Nashville and pursuing a career in music full time. Somewhat ironically, having hemophilia led me to one of the most important friendships that I've made since moving here. And that's with a producer and songwriter named Adam B. Smith. He's produced some songs for major artists like Andy Grammer and he owns a studio in East Nashville called The Robot Factory. So his son has hemophilia and we met at the Tennessee annual meeting about five years ago. His son was probably not even one years old when we met. Adam was a new hemophilia dad and he didn't really know too much about it. So he was a lot like my parents when, when I was young, just wanting to talk to people in similar situations and learn, hey, what is this? And what does this mean for our kid? And what will life look like in a few years? But he and I really hit it off and we ended up starting writing songs together. We wrote a few times when I was in college at Belmont, and then once I really got serious when I graduated, we started writing once a week, and that was awesome. I recently wrote a song with him that we recorded at his studio in Nashville, and I put that song out as my new single on May 15th, just about a month ago, and I really believe it's one of the best songs that I've been a part of writing. But that's just been such a cool relationship that came from the hemophilia community. In that sense, Having hemophilia has really helped me in my career. In normal times, I try to play at least one gig a week, whether that's downtown on Broadway in Nashville at the Honky Tonk Bars, or whether that's a cool show or a writer's round somewhere in Nashville. I try to get in front of my friends, my family, and fans as much as I can, but obviously that's changed quite a bit because of COVID. The world kind of has stopped in a lot of ways, and I think missing live entertainment has been one of the hardest things for me because it's just such a comforting part of my life and everybody's life. I mean, we all want to go out to concerts, we all want to watch sports, and we all want to see a bunch of entertaining things. Platforms like Facebook and Instagram Live, TikTok, live streaming, that's all been really popular a lot lately. I played a really great gig that was a live stream at one of the best venues in Nashville called Analog. It was a great venue and it was just me and the camera guy and the booking person. I guess I played for as many people that tuned in, so could have been three people, could have been a million people. But to be honest, nothing will ever replace live music. I also recently played a really cool gig. It was a 60th wedding anniversary in, in a couple's front yard. I played a few songs for them and it was just really fun. I think the current state of the world is Definitely going to change a lot because of how entertainment industry works, but I don't ever think live music will disappear completely because it's just too hard to replace. But on a positive note, the pandemic kind of urged me to put out the single I mentioned because I know so many people are home right now looking for ways to be entertained. This song is my first big release that I feel confident in, and I really wanted to put some strong efforts behind it. I think it's a really good time to grow on social media. I ended up gaining about a thousand followers on Instagram over this time and I think it's been something that I've really wanted to do for a long time but now that I'm releasing this song and it's 100% the sound that I'm going for, I feel confident in gaining fans and gaining followers. For many reasons, hemophilia has actually been a positive force in my life rather than a negative. Now one of the main reasons I say that is there are actually a ton of scholarships for people in the bleeding disorders community who are attending accredited universities. I actually got every dime of my college paid for through a combination of university scholarships and music scholarships from Belmont and scholarships from the hemophilia community. It was about half and half. So hemophilia really helped me go to Belmont University, one of the best schools in the nation. But I'm just so thankful for the role that hemophilia has played in my life because I would not be the person I am today without it. I know where to find you, 10 a.m. every single Saturday. 
Sipping on a double shot, almond milk, latte. You'll be by the window, sitting in the same place. That was a little taste of a new single from our first contributor, Trevor Martin. You'll be able to hear the rest of Trevor's track, entitled Go To, at the end of the episode. Next, we're going to hear from Nicole Angeles. Some of you might remember Nicole as a share segment contributor on our Bloodstream podcast. A couple years ago, she shared a harrowing story of living with VWD. Well, she has a remarkable update, which is both inspiring and also somewhat harrowing still. She has been through a lot in the last few months, but there is a very exciting light at the end of this tunnel. Here's Nicole. Everyone may remember me from my last piece discussing my struggles living with Von Willebrand disease as a woman. It's been some time and I have much to discuss as a follow-up. I always want to make sure when I am sharing a piece of my life, I am as informative as possible with a touch of enlightenment. There has been many changes since I last shared my story. It's only right that I tell you about the beauty and challenges of my journey. Since my last story, I'm now pregnant. I last discussed that I was given two choices, hysterectomy or have a baby. Instead of rushing to get pregnant, I decided to follow up with a new hematologist at an HTC in New York City. After much discussion and many blood draws, I was finally able to control my heavy menstrual cycles with frequent infusions. This gave me the ability to have a baby on my own terms instead of being forced. It also helped me with my relationship, being that my husband also did not feel forced to have a child when he was not ready. However, since getting pregnant, I have hit a few bumps in the road. In early February, I contracted a strand of the coronavirus after being exposed at work. At the time, I was about 10 weeks pregnant. This was before the coronavirus had fully hit the US and before a global pandemic had been declared. I was sent home and quarantined until my symptoms resolved. Thankfully, my symptoms did resolve and I was able to return to work. However, about three weeks later, I contracted RSV, which is a respiratory centrical virus. I was still very early in my pregnancy but I also do have asthma, so my breathing was compromised and I was hospitalized. By that time, we were in the middle of the pandemic, so after the hospitalization, I was sent home and told not to return to work until after I give birth due to having a high-risk pregnancy. All of this was very scary for me, of course. However, I'm glad that I recovered and I'm home safely. Throughout the pregnancy, of course, I also experienced different types of bleeds. Years before I became pregnant, I was advised by several physicians that once I did get pregnant, the bleeding would be under control. To my surprise, they were completely wrong. When I was working, I had noticed a hematoma to my left lower leg. It was so bad that I could not walk. I went to the hospital, but they could offer no explanation. I had also noticed multiple bruises throughout my body. I decided to reach out to both my HTC and my OB doctor. They both decided that infusing once a week, every week, was the safest thing for me to do. Since I was planning to give birth in a different county from my HTC, my OB doctor advised me to see the hematologist at the hospital. Unfortunately, I have seen this hematology team before and we did not leave on a good note. Their lack of knowledge of VWD caused me to leave their practice. My OB reached out to one of the doctors personally via email to explain the situation. So the team was aware I was coming in to discuss a birthing plan. However, as soon as the doctor came into the room, the appointment went completely south. The first thing he said to me was, I'm confused why you're here. Right away, my face was puzzled. I said to him, well, I'm pregnant and I have VWD. I'm here to discuss that. He replied, well, don't you go to the city for your care? I said, yes. However, I live here in Suffolk County, so I would be giving birth here, and that would mean we would need you on board. He had an issue with that, that I was being seen in the city by another hematologist, and since we did not have a good past, it would not have made sense for them to take care of me. It seemed like he was turning me away. However, at the end of the appointment, He said when I got to 28 weeks, 
he would have to see me every week until I give birth. I left that appointment completely confused and in tears. I immediately called my HTC and my OB to tell them I was afraid to give birth without the proper care team. When my OB heard about the details of my upsetting appointment, he reached out to the doctor to let him know we no longer needed his services. This pregnancy has had so many ups and downs so far and some very scary moments. But the most important thing to me is a safe delivery during this pandemic. I know that I must fight for what I know is to be right for the safety of both me and my daughter. Being pregnant during this pandemic and having a blood disorder has been very challenging and very scary. I have a lot of time on my hands, which is preparing me for my birth, meaning making sure that I have enough fusions for myself, for the delivery, and that my daughter has everything she needs when she arrives. It is important to see the positivity during the negative time in history. And although there is a global pandemic, I cannot forget that I have a bleeding disorder and that I'm pregnant and my safety comes first, no matter anyone's opinion. I'm nervous to give birth, not only because of the coronavirus, but also because of the bleeding that I will have to go through. Thankfully, I have an amazing HTC to guide me through my bleeding and my OB who has knowledge of bleeding disorders and pregnancy. I hope my stories can empower other women to advocate for themselves when they hit a roadblock. As you know, I have hit a few roadblocks, but I have come out of them smiling, happier, healthier, and more knowledgeable about my care. I'm due anytime during the summer, and I promise to follow up with an amazing story of how a woman with VWD had a successful and eventful birth. Lastly, we're going to hear from Julian Borges. Julian has been very active within the community for a while, and when the pandemic struck, he took a proactive approach to making sure he stayed connected and created some wonderful resources for all of us in the process. Here's Julian. We often don't appreciate what we have until we lose it. Quarantine highlighted the little joys I take for granted, like seeing my family and my friends, and even just saying hello to the friendly people in my apartment building. Wearing a mask really made me miss being able to simply smile at those around me. I noticed I really had to over-communicate, trying to say a a really loud and happy hello uh, in lieu of my kind of usual smirk or smile or head nod. I feel a connection during all this social distancing, I had to go out of my way to communicate. Like everyone, it seems, I started spending a lot more time socializing electronically. Honestly, it started off just keeping the group chat going with my friends, Uh, but as time and boredom went on, I started texting people that I haven't spoken to in a while. Of course, I I miss my immediate family. We had started playing online games like Animal Crossing, and my college buddies and I even started a campaign for Dungeons and Dragons. But when they started canceling all the hemophilia events, I knew we'd have to try harder to keep connected with my community. A friend I made through the hemophilia community, Matthew Porges, thought we could start a simple Facebook group to help those coping with COVID-19. Matt was isolating alone with his very cute dog, but he wanted another way to pass the time and We started talking to the other friends that we had missed from events. So one of the things that we did was start a Facebook group. The first thing we did was make sure that any medical or scientific information posted was not only factual with citations, but had reliable sources. One of the first events that we simulcast was a NHF and HFA webinar on COVID-19 as it relates to hemophilia. The information that they gave us really put me at ease and helped me feel prepared for this crisis coming ahead. Other people from the community started reaching out to us to share their time and expertise. Debbie De La Riva spoke with us on mental health and how to be present and calm in situations that may cause others to panic. One of the lessons that she taught us that I really liked was how to not catastrophize, how to not kind of pile all the issues on top of each other, but to spread them out so that way they're more digestible, smaller pieces. We also did a lot of events that just kind of helped 
with not just mental health, but physical health. For instance, Rick Starks, someone I had not met before, but he really won me over with his laid back uh, Tai Chi routine that we did remotely. Another friend of mine, Mike Hargett, and a friend of Matt's, Liz Purvis, did cooking demonstrations for those staying at home, kind of uh, reminding us to take care of our, our body and um, also those around us uh, and to enjoy the free time that we suddenly had. Another friend, Charity Borst, was using her time to make masks as Kim Bernstein helped find groups that were distributing those masks to the people that needed them. I've seen others in the community make a real effort to connect during these times. I've attended online events with NHF, HFA, and Hope for Hemophilia. For instance, HFA and NHF teamed up with Dr. Valentino and spoke about medical concerns of COVID-19 and bleeding disorders such as hemophilia. Hope for Hemophilia hosted remote groups where patients talked about common issues and personally, I finally got to see some of the family of friends that I had been missing from the hemophilia community all in one place. It definitely did not make up for missing each other in person, but we at least got some connection and kind of met up again. I was all set to wrap up this chapter of my life. I had a few interesting events, made some friends, and learned a lesson. Quarantine completed. And then I broke my tooth. I'm not going to lie, breaking a tooth is more emotional than painful. It didn't really even hurt at the time. I'd previously had a root canal 13 years ago, uh, and the tooth was fractured. The dentist told me that there was no way to fix it, so I should use it till you lose it. Uh, and I did lose it during an epidemic. I was eating breakfast, getting ready for my day. I bit, I heard a crack. I felt with my tongue, there was a gap where my molar used to be. I grabbed a paper towel, dabbed it to my gum, and I pulled back and it was red. I knew that my hemophilia would be an issue in this as well, but I didn't panic. I knew this would come and I had planned ahead, sort of. I had prepared a plan, but obviously plans had to change because of COVID-19. So I couldn't get a hold of my dental surgeon. I Googled really quickly. Um, I found one nearby with pretty good reviews uh, that was still open as an essential service. In my state of Illinois, dental work is considered essential. I would need to wear a mask and arrive in the next 20 minutes to see the surgeon immediately. So the second thing I did after I made the appointment was call my hematologist. I have two hematologists, uh, one affiliated with a local HTC in Chicago and another that is a personal friend. My HTC didn't pick up right away, so I called Dr. Wesley, who I just called Doc. Doc knew what to do. He started sending out the prescriptions I would need uh, and said that he would give his number and exchange numbers with the oral surgeon. Having a direct line of communication really saved any potential pain, waiting times, or even worse. At that point, I went into kind of hemophilia autopilot. I grabbed my emergency factor, put it in an insulated bag, which I already had, along with my travel letter, which, while the dentist would only be a few minutes down the block, I figured it would work domestically. And then I got ready for the insurance. This is the non-medical part of hemophilia. I knew I had to have everything ready to take with me in case of a medical emergency. All my paperwork was in a folder and I brought that with me. And while I do have insurance, I should note that I had to pay upfront 50% out of pocket for the procedure. I am really glad that there was that COVID-19 stimulus because with that money on hand, I was able to afford that sudden cost. Um, I additionally took a ride share service to the dental office. And while in the waiting room, I was infusing my medication um, if someone has hemophilia, of course, they know that this must do, be done intravenously. So I was just hit the vein as the nurse called my name. I told her I was almost done, but neither of us could really gauge facial reactions because we had our mask on. Later, when she was taking my history and vitals, I explained what I was doing in the waiting room, and she was shocked that I could infuse intravenously. I told her I'd been doing it since I was a teen, and I'm actually surprised more so when people don't know. The surgeon seemed apprehensive at first, most likely due to the fact that we'd never spoken. I almost, 
uh, I really did pull his name from the phone book. But he'd been practicing for 10 years and had a clean office. Um, and kind of noticing his demeanor, I just want to say this for people in the medical field, like we notice how doctors treat nurses and sometimes it could just make you really question that person. So this doctor was extremely kind to his nurses during this kind of uh, stressing um, pandemic, I don't know what to call it, during these kind of trying times. And just that consideration that he showed for those around him really made me feel at ease as a patient. After he asked a few questions about hemophilia, he left the room to call my hematologist. When the oral surgeon came back, he was enthusiastic. Doc had reassured him, and we had a great plan of action. The direct line of communication helped out again. The surgery started after some local anesthetic. He, and I'm going to describe it here, just grabbed what kind of appeared to be pliers and started yanking at the tooth. You kind of feel a head jerk, and then what sounds like a tear, you know it's an actual break, as they pull it out. And he showed me the tooth. <laughs> it's a, kind of a gross procedure, bone and blood, but this incident started at 11. I was home by 1. My wonderful partner, Anthony, ran around and he picked up all my prescriptions. My insurance wouldn't cover the oral medication, which a lot of hemophiliacs are probably used to. It's something, a flavor that's gross, but I remember from childhood. I was able to find the pill form. I hate that insurance dictates even these small medical decisions, but I'm still thankful for the privilege of having access to medical care. All in all, I was able to have a relatively easy emergency service during the middle of a pandemic and I wasn't destroyed financially. So little miracles there. I'm currently back home eating ice cream and jello and soup for the next few days. I'm healing up pretty well with minimal pain but I am still in quarantine. I have been talking to my friends remotely as much as I can. I'm amazed by how staying in contact and communicating has helped me during this period of social isolation. I'm so happy to keep connected with my family and friends, and I hope some of the techniques that we are using now will continue to unify us as a community to just make sure that we appreciate the importance of communication. This episode of Bloodstream Journeys was written by Heather Robb, featuring real life stories from Trevor Martin, Nicole Angeles, and Julian Borges. This episode was produced by Rob Bradford and Greg Holdsman. Audio editing by Colby Crow. Sound design and post-production support by Joshua Sterling Bragg. Distribution and engagement by Ava Friedman. Art and promotion by Christina Newhart and Ryan Geelan. Bloodstream Journeys is executive produced by Patrick James Lynch and Ryan Geelan. If you want to reflect on your journey to this moment, this moment right here, and tell your story, visit us at bloodstreammedia.com backslash my story. We have a simple form. Write your story in it. Or tell us a little about yourself and what you want to write about, even if you don't yet know how. And click submit. We'll be in touch and together we'll get your story told. Bloodstream Journeys would not be possible without the incredible ongoing support of Biomarin. So we say thank you to Biomarin for their vision and generosity and all the ways they empower the bleeding disorders community to learn, heal, and grow through self-expression. Thank you, Biomarin. Other Bloodstream podcasts include the community touchstone, The Bloodstream Podcast. Bloodstream is an entertaining and informative podcast hosted by Natalie and Patrick Lynch and provides a 360-degree look at the bleeding disorders community through news, interviews, and informed opinionating on the topics that matter most. We also produce the popular Ask the Expert podcast. Ask the Expert was created to help answer some of the biggest questions we receive from community members, both online and in person, as we travel the country producing content and live events for the community. Ask the Expert is hosted by Believe's Director of Innovation and former nonprofit executive, Amy Board, and features the top community experts on new subjects every episode. Also, there will be a bunch of new shows and podcasts coming throughout 2020 from Bloodstream Media. So be sure to visit www.bloodstreammedia.com for all of the shows produced by us. Or you can search Bloodstream Media anywhere podcasts are distributed, downloaded, streamed, or watched. Happy listening. I want to be a good
Single Saturday, sipping on a double shot, almond milk latte. You'll be by the window, sitting in the same place. Always in a roll top ball cap, but Reese doesn't even have to ask. Girl, you know what you like, and I like that. I know you got your go-to T-shirt, a go-to line when you try. Pick me up so when your heart hurts. It always works. And tonight, after that glass of Pinot Noir with your girls at your go-to wine bar, I'll be here for you. I wanna be the one you go to. Girl, I go to, but there are a couple things that I do. I'd show you that you might. I think I'm pretty cool. You can raid my apartment and take whatever you want to. And I wouldn't be that surprised if what you find are my favorites too. I know you got your go-to T-shirt. I go to lie when you're trying to flirt. I pick me up slow when your heart hurts. It always works. And tonight, after that glass of Pinot Noir with the girls that you go to wine bar, I'll be here for you. I wanna be the one you go to. And when your back's up against the wall. Got your go-to T-shirt, a go-to line when you're trying to flirt. I pick me up song when your heart hurts. It always works in tonight. After that glass of Pinot Noir with your girls at your go-to wine bar, oh I'll be here for you. I wanna be the one you go to. Go to Trevor Martin.